Hello, everyone, and a very, very warm welcome to the Barbara Ward Lecture honouring Outstanding Women in Development. Thank you to all of you for being part of our virtual space today. We're really delighted to have you all here with us this evening. And we are also delighted about the truly outstanding speakers that we have um, and we're going to hear from tonight and who will be introduced shortly. Uh, my name is Juliet. I'm the events officer at IIED and I'll be providing technical support during this event along with uh, some IIED colleagues who are behind the scenes. So with that, please allow me to hand over to Andrew Norton, the director of IIED, uh, for our welcome words. Thank you. Huge thanks, Juliet. It's my great pleasure to kick off tonight's Barbara Ward Lecture. Um, finally, after a long wait, um, IID's Barbara Ward Lectures are normally held every couple of years, every two years, but due to the pandemic, we had to put this back, this one back from 2020 to 2021, and we wound up entirely online. We were hoping to have an in-person element. But anyway, it's great that we got there in the end, um, and it's my pleasure to welcome you all to the lecture. Barbara Ward Lectures have featured a range of outstanding women leaders in development thinking and practice, including Mary Robinson, Deborah Roberts, Groharlan Brundtland, Fatima Denton, and Christiana Figueres. Tonight, we are really delighted to have Rebecca Greenspan, the former chair of IIED's board, um, and recently appointed to lead UNCTAD, the UN Conference on Trade and Development. Rebecca is also a former vice president of Costa Rica and will be reflecting on her country's journey really to the forefront of the struggle for sustainable development so visible when Costa Rica and Denmark stepped up at COP26 to lead the Beyond Oil and Gas um, Alliance, which is um, really the cutting edge of the fight against the climate crisis. In 2021, we have been thinking particularly about IAD's founder, Barbara Ward, and her amazing legacy. And that's because this year, 2021, marks IAD's 50th year. There are a number of things to look out for in relation to the work we are doing to celebrate 50 years of IAD. We've published a number of blogs. The most recent one was just last week and looking at the legacy of IAD's drylands work. In the new year, we are publishing an edition of our Make Change Happen podcast, and that will be a conversation between IID's first ever paid employee, Dave Runnels, and our dear ex-colleague, Achila Abisinghe, who is now Director and Head of Programs for Asia at the Global Green Growth Institute, GGGI. And that conversation will explore the role that an organisation like IID can play in the future, as well as looking at all the experience embodied in IID's 50 years. We will be launching our alumni group on LinkedIn just before Christmas, and we'll be inviting ex-colleagues and partners and friends to give their thoughts on where sustainable development is now and what the future will look like. This will contribute to a piece we are preparing that will be released in March of next year for the 50th anniversary, titled Movements Not Moments, that will examine IID's journey in the light of the partnerships and the intellectual and social movements that IID has been part of over the last 50 years. We're also working to showcase the work of our partners on our website, and the first five pieces in that series will appear early next year. So it's now my great pleasure to introduce some reflections from our dear colleague, David Satterthwaite, who very recently stood down as an IIED staff member after 47 years of incredible work. Um, and for me personally, it was a real privilege, has been a real privilege um, to have David as a colleague. Um, we're very much looking forward to continuing working with David as a senior associate, but this is really a moment to celebrate his immense contribution, not just to IIED's work on human settlements, but also to the creation and nurturing of what is really a global community of practice focused on issues of environment and urbanization with a focus on low-income people in informal settlements and how they could be included and their organizations could be included as voices in global debates. 
David's own contribution to the study of urban social and environmental change has of course been immense. I would encourage anyone who hasn't looked at it um, to take a look at the blog series he curated over the last year on the transition to a predominantly urban world. There's a lot of incredibly useful, constructive, fascinating, but also visceral material about the realities of urban change. Now, in the context of the Barbara Ward lecture, David it has been our last staff member who worked personally himself directly with Barbara Ward. So it's really very special to have these reflections from him on Barbara, her legacy and IIED. At the end of 1972, Barbara Ward could look back at what had been a very successful year with some satisfaction. The UN Conference on the Human Environment had been a great success. The book that she authored with René Dubot for the conference, Only One Earth, Care and Maintenance of a Small Planet, had been published to great acclaim. A potentially disastrous boycott by more than half the world's nations had been avoided. The group of 77 had threatened to boycott the conference, saying that it was a northern agenda. Barbara Ward had worked hard behind the scenes to avoid this, and Only One Earth included the key development issues that were the main concern of the Group of 77. She had set the foundation for sustainable development in 1972, as she said that the charge of the UN to the Stockholm Conference was clearly to define what should be done to maintain the Earth as a place suitable for human life, not only now, but also for future generations. But she was struggling with cancer, wanted to return to England. Into this came an invitation from the International Institute for Environmental Affairs to become its president. This was a new institution headed by David Runnels, who had been one of her grad students during her time as professor at Columbia University. She agreed but asked that the name be changed to the International Institute for Environment and Development and that the institute move to London. 1972 was also a time of growing disquiet that international aid focused too much on the big infrastructure, the ports, the dams, the airports, and not enough on meeting people's basic needs. For instance, for water, for sanitation, for healthcare, for schools. There was the worry too that the new concern for the environment was also ignoring meeting basic needs. Hence, there's a fantastic challenge to the new institute to show how environment and development issues can be combined and should be combined. So Barbara Ward returned to England. She worked mostly from her home in a small English village for much of the time bedridden. I was her research assistant for her last two books and I had this wonderful office in her attic with an amazing view of the English countryside. Meanwhile, David Runnels built the institution in London. Five features of the emerging new IIED remain and have served the Institute well. Bring in remarkable people. Jorge Ardoy, truly the outstanding urbanist of his generation, accepted Barbara Ward's invitation to join IIED and form a human settlements program. So he set up our sister institution, EEA de America Latina, and he built a very influential program of research and support for action across Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Jerry Leach, all six foot seven of him, was invited to develop an energy program that included a very innovative, path-breaking, low energy strategy for the UK in 1976, and an assessment of deforestation in Africa that showed the importance of reforestation. Anil Agarwal, really one of the world's best known environmentalists, was invited to IIED's Media Information Unit, EarthScan. He then returned to India to set up the Centre for Science and Environment that was to become one of the most influential NGOs. A second feature of, of work is work in partnership with Global South organisations, including civil society. You can't do research on the Global South stuck in the Global North. This was to become a characteristic of much of IIED's work, the working with local partners. The Human Settlements Group, for instance, was formed by research institutes in India, Nigeria, Argentina, and the Sudan. The third feature, convene strategic meetings. Barbara Ward convened or chaired so many critical meetings during the 1970s. These brought together the world's best specialists from the North and the South. 
they issued recommendations that were to influence international discussions, agendas, and institutions. This includes the meetings just before the global UN conferences on food and on human settlements. The fourth feature which Barbara would exemplify was tenacity. Keep going, keep pushing. She was certainly a powerful influence on getting more attention for water and sanitation through highlighting this need over the years in her books and articles, in her briefings for prime ministers and presidents, through expert meetings mentioned already, through her address to the plenary of the UN Conference on Human Settlements at which ambitious targets for improving water and sanitation were endorsed by all governments. The fifth feature was working with and serving the press. Barbara Ward was an accomplished journalist uh, as well as a development specialist. She reached huge audiences through her popular books. Only One Earth was published in 13 languages. She could write in The Economist supplements about the different UN conferences. She wrote often in the Washington Post. And she supported young journalists um, through press briefings and study visits. Sometimes the subtlety of her language eluded understanding. The UN Environment Programme had supported the preparation of her last book, Progress for a Small Planet. We sent them a copy of the manuscript. The only comment we got was, remove racist text on page 191. But we turned to page 191, we scratched our heads. And what she had talked about is the not entirely unastute Japanese as a very elegant and sweet comment on their astuteness. It was misunderstood, we had to remove it. So perhaps there's a sixth feature that we inherited from the early 1970s, our sister institution. When asked about the possibilities of getting needed change in global and local environment and development, she said that it was our duty to hope. It was our duty to hope. Um, huge thanks to David for those thoughts and insights on Barbara Ward, her special and seminal contribution to sustainable development and her work with IIED. It's now my pleasure to introduce our board chair, Dr. Tara Schein, who will be the moderator for today's event. Tara is a climate scientist and experienced policy advisor and climate negotiator, and has worked with a range of development organizations, including Irish Aid, Swedish CEDA, and the Mary Robinson Foundation for Climate Justice. She is also director and co-founder of Change by Degrees, a social enterprise that delivers sustainability advice. In advance of COP26, she was appointed co-facilitator of the Structured Expert Dialogue under the UNFCCC. That's a science policy discussion which forms part of efforts to achieve uh, the long-term goal of keeping the average global temperature increase within the targets set by the Paris Agreement, obviously with a particular focus on the critical 1.5 degree target. We're very proud to have Tara as our chair and delighted to have her with us to moderate this event. Tara, please go ahead. Thank you, Andy and Rune. And I'm so, so, so excited to be introducing Rebecca Greenspan to you all today. It's been lovely listening to David Satterwhite uh, reminiscing of IIED. And IIED and I are almost exactly the same age. Um, so I will be 50 next year. Um, David spoke a lot of 1972, the year I was born. And it strikes me how much things have progressed, uh, yet how much the challenges uh, remain the same in that time period. Um, and, and, and what I am proud of in that time is how much IID has been at the center of those discussions and always on the side of fairness, uh, truth, um, science and research and the voices of the most vulnerable people um, being represented and heard and used to inform policy. So colleagues, thank you for joining us. Uh, we had hoped, I had hoped I might have been clinking glasses with Rebecca after this lecture for a real life glass of wine, but it is not to be so, um, but we will find a chance in the future. Um, the IIED Barbara Ward lectures are always fun. They're always a networking opportunity. It's always a chance to get to meet people that you haven't seen in a long while. So unfortunately, we don't have that this evening, but we are going to have uh, breakout groups after Rebecca's uh, words to us so that we get a moment just to say hi to some other people that are here in this virtual room with us. 
And of course, we've set up this evening's um, event so that there's lots of opportunity to ask questions and for this to be interactive. Um, so we'll hear from Rebecca first, but then we will also uh, hear from you. So do stay tuned and get ready to, to get involved. So Andy has given an introduction to uh, the amazing roles that Rebecca has played in her, in her life to date. Um, and I have to say that when I succeeded Rebecca as chair of the board of IID in 2019, I possibly had my first case of imposter syndrome ever. Um, I remember being part of a, a leadership program for women in science where we had to talk about you know, experiences we'd had with imposter syndrome. And I really couldn't come up with any until I came to fill the shoes of Rebecca Greenspan. Um, to add to the accolades um, that um, Andy has, has read out, just to note that um, in 2014 and 2015, Rebecca was recognized as one of the 50 leading intellectuals of Latin America, so she is very clever. But she's also been recognized as one of the most 100 po most powerful women in Central America by Forbes magazine, not just in 2017, but also in 2018, 2019 and 2020. Um, she has been honored by the Spanish government, by the president of Portugal. Um, she has honorary awards. She is really, really amazing. And the most amazing part of Rebecca is that she is a consistent advocate for human development, for the people um, at the heart of development, for inequality and poverty, and for gender equality. And Rebecca, as, as a, a woman leader um, seeking to um, fill those big shoes that you left behind in IID. I thank you for the leadership um, and for the great role model that you are for all of us. And I cannot wait to hear your, your wise words for us this evening. So uh, Rebecca, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you and welcome everybody to the 2021 Barbara Ward Lecture. Thank you so much, Tara, for those very warm, very kind words from you. Uh, you know, uh, I, I have seen firsthand uh, the great contribution to environment and development that uh, IID has, has made. And uh, listening to David uh, and the, uh, you know, listening to the uh, things we have to learn from, from the lessons learned, the legacy of Barbara Ward, I always uh, start to say that uh, we, the ones, the women that today are in these positions have to really thank those that opened the door for us before. Because none of, none of us would have been here if it was not for many women <laughs> that they fought for us and for our rights before. So really, really uh, being here today uh, in this unique institution uh, with a staff that is, uh, because IID has a staff that is really committed to the values that inspired uh, IID from the beginning. Uh, it's an institution, like, like you said, Tara, where science and research and action happens together, uh, where we learn from the people, from the communities, from the local partners, like David, uh, like David said, we learn from their experiences. We work with them. They are actors of the journey that uh, we all try to uh, uh, walk uh, towards collective solutions. So this is an institution that never lost the objective of improving people's lives while caring for our planet. And this is a legacy of Barbara Ward, as we heard, an amazing woman. And it's really an honor uh, for me to give the Barbara Ward lecture. So really, thank you. Uh, I, I want to send a warm, warm regards to, to Andrew Norton and, and to the board colleagues and, and the colleagues of IID from from whom I learned so much during, during the years that I, that I was there. And I am sure, uh, uh, Tara, that uh, you are doing already such an amazing job. So uh, no imposter syndrome needed. <laughs> so thank you, thank you really to Andy, to the staff, to the wonderful people that, that does, uh, makes IID great, you know. 
Uh, my lecture today is uh, about my country and about uh, the journey that Costa Rica uh, traveled from being a poor country to a global sustainable development leader. Not only climate change, but sustainable development, I would say. And I will divide my lecture in three parts. First, I will talk about our history, what shaped us. Second, I will talk about our climate policy over the years, what we have learned. And I will conclude with, with, with lessons that can be you know, uh, taken from our experience. I have a lot to say. I will try not to abuse your time. Uh, but uh, probably to understand Costa Rica, we will have to start uh, with our geography. You know? Carolyn Hall, uh, an Oxford geographer, called Costa Rica a tropical laboratory because few places in the world have so much ecological variety in such a small place. Costa Rica is about 50,000 square kilometers big, so very small. <laughs> And it's about the size of Denmark. But we have more plant and anim animal species than uh, the US and Canada combined. And this is true, and this is our wealth uh, in terms of nature. But you have to understand that when nature was not valued, uh, we didn't have what was valued. We didn't have gold or silver or precious stones. So we never, and we never had a, a very big population. So Costa Rica was one of the poorest and most peripheral Spanish colonies uh, at that time. And at the same time, because of these characteristics, because we were peripheral and we were poor and we didn't have uh, what was valued at the time, and we didn't have a big population, the truth is that uh, we were more decentralized and less concentrated in terms of power and, and money than other parts of uh, Latin America. So that, that characteristic was very important because Costa Rica eh, 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 had this characteristic from, from the beginning. Yes? So what was at the time a bad thing through time became a good thing, yes? Uh, the other thing that we have to remember is that Costa Rica remained a very rural, uh, rural and agricultural country until very recently. Uh, so we, we were a country of uh, subsistence farmers. Our link to international trade and bigger commercial plantations started uh, uh, only in 1830, uh, when coffee production started in Costa Rica. But even in 1963, or even in the 60s, Costa Rica was still half rural. Half of the population still lived in the rural areas. So the question really is how a country of small farmers, rich in biodiversity, but poor in other resources, became a climate leader for the world, yes. And uh, there are three moments in history that I would highlight that explain a, a big part of this journey. Uh, the, the first is that Costa Rica declared education free and compulsory for girls and boys in 1869, and I will refer to this in a moment. 1869, primary education, free and compulsory for girls and boys. In 1948, after the Civil War of Costa Rica, Costa Rica abolished the army, abolished the military, democratized credit, set up big public programs and institutions for basic needs, for energy access, for water and sanitation, and for social protection. And in the 70s, so 1869, 1948, and in the 70s, where really our climate policy began, Costa Rica protected 25% of its territory. 
In a way, as a friend of mine used to say, Costa Rica did things where, when nobody expected Costa Rica to make them. <laughs> we did things when they were not in the fashion. Nobody was talking about them, <laughs> you know? Uh, so, and these events, doing the right thing, marked our history of success. And in my mind, uh, these three events are marked not only because of what was achieved, but because what was the state of the country when, when, when we achieve, achieve it? And let me, let me tell you why, you know. In 1869, I told you that we were the most peripheral and poor of the colonies in the Spanish Empire. It, it was at the, at, in, in the midst of, of the 19th century that we got our independence. So in 1869, when we declared education free and compulsory for boys and girls, we were around 200,000 people in Costa Rica, 200,000 inhabitants, very small population. 94% of the country was in extreme poverty. And remember, we did things when nobody expected us to do them. You know. At that time, France and the US did not have free and compulsory education, but Costa Rica did. <laughs> and uh, you, you, can, you can see here what is to think about the next generations. You know, Costa Rica didn't have water inside the countries. You know, we were, as I said, 94% of the population was in extreme poverty. We didn't need to written write for what the the jobs were at that time, or the activities of the people were at that time, so subsistence uh, activities. And still, we thought that education was the most important priority for the country. It took us a long time to get to universal primary education. It didn't happen right away. We didn't have the resources to happen right away, but it gave us a moving target. <laughs> I, it gave us something to move, move towards it. And it became the most important mobility, social mobility instrument of the country. In 1949, when we abolished the military, half of the population was still poor. Half of the population was still poor. And obviously, nobody expected us to do something like that. We abolished the military in the Constitution, <laughs> precisely after a civil war. And the one that abolished the army was the one that won the civil war. So in a way, he abolished his own army and decided that those resources were better to put them to good use for the people. And in 1970, we protected 25% of our territory. Our GDP per capita at that moment in the 70s was $500 per person, $500 per person. One of the lowest in Latin America at that time. And still this vision, yes, this idea that you have to look for the future, that you have to have a vision and a strategy to be able to get there was so strong that we did these three things. Probably no non-economist, I am an economist, would have advised Costa Rica to do any of this <laughs> at that time. <laughs> so these historical decisions had massive consequences for our development. Mandatory education meant Costa Rica always had oversupply of educated professionals. So when, and, and people, educated people, it, when, public, when the public sector expanded to provide the services, we had the best people that was in the country, that was educated, that was waiting for a job opportunity. Not only men, also women. <laughs> so because education was compulsory for men, for boys and girls. Also women enter the 
a working force when the public services were expanding. And because the public sector discriminate less than other activities, so women also started to have a more prominent a, a role in terms of Costa Rica's, Costa Rica's uh, development. So, it, it, and, and, and as you can see, so education was the main vehicle for social mobility during all that time. Having uh, no army meant that we had more resources for social development, obviously. If you can sum up, what other countries have spent in the military uh, during all those decades. Costa Rica dedicated those investments to education and health. But the other consequence of that is that the elites were forced to negotiate to get their way <laughs> because you didn't have a uh, repression <laughs> instrument uh, for your population. You needed to negotiate. You needed to dialogue. You needed to go to the institutions, to the parliament. And that obliged us to have a common project. <laughs> you, we, we didn't change so much because a lot of the decisions needed to be made by consensus. And protecting the territory, uh, the 25% of our territory in the 70s meant that this country of small farmers could become one of the richest, more diversified countries in the Western Hemisphere. And it did such a contribution to our economy, to our, not, not, not only because we protected the environment, because it became a mark of the country and it became part of its diversification and successful economic story. So the other feature probably of these three great events coming together is that uh, uh, it, th these decisions were permanent. <laughs> you know, there was the buy-in of the people. <laughs> And so you couldn't go against them. Even when there were the, the wars in, in Central America, when there were such violent times where uh, we, we had the, the Sandinistas in Nicaragua and the contrast against the Sandinistas and they wanted to use Costa Rica and there were voices saying that we needed the military again, nobody will dare to propose those in Costa Rica because the country wanted the peace, because they believed it was the right decision to take because they benefited from the story. So these historical decisions were permanent through a culture of dialogue and institutions and a sense of a common national project that the people defended. So several institutions became, in fact, the trademark of our common identity. And uh, we, we, we had a common project that we defended. And as an example, I always think uh, when I was already in government, I am much older than Tara. <laughs> I, I was born before IIED <laughs> and we were, in the last decade, when in the de debt crisis of Latin America, when we were in our negotiations and in our debt negotiations that Costa Rica also defaulted at that time, were very difficult times for all of us. And we hope not to see them again with this crisis. And we negotiated with the World Bank and with the IMF in the 80s. It was the midst of the Washington consensus of uh, a very neoliberal agenda, yeah. And these institutions survived the test. In many other countries, they didn't. We didn't privatize education and we didn't privatize health and we didn't privatize the pension system or the, the electrical institutions. 
afterwards we opened up the market for competition, but we didn't privatize them. And so this strong sense that education, health, electricity for all, social protection, water and sanitation, the national parks, were public services and needed to be there for all. That was very strong and, uh, and, and it was really an integral part of our social contract uh, and the social cohesion strategy of our, of our common project. Uh, uh, when when the, the many of the international organizations were pushing for focalization of the social services, I remember these uh, discussions very clearly, yes? Because uh, the problem with the focalization at that time was not to focalize in, in, the, in the very poor. It was that you, need, you wanted to exclude, they wanted to exclude the middle classes <laughs> from the services. The problem was not to get to the very poor because we needed to go farther to get there. But the problem is that the proposal was to exclude the middle classes to be able to include the others, something that never happened in the countries that followed that advice. And we defended and, and said very clearly that we were a, a, a stable with a, a country with a social contract where the middle classes were a very important part of it. And that they, it was impossible to have a social compact without the middle classes and breaking the alliance of the middle classes with the poor because then there will be no voice and there will be no quality services. So the whole thing about these public services was that we made those services for the middle classes and we included the poor. So they had much better services than when you have poor services for the poor people. So we defended our social compact because, and that's the important thing, we actually had one. <laughs> you cannot defend what you don't have, but we had a social compact and we defended it. So this takes me to the second part of, of, of my talk to you today, Costa Rica's climate policy. Yeah. And, uh, Costa Rica, you know, climate, the, the climate part of our social contract, it, it has been there for a long time, yes? Because it, it, the climate policy has brought also dynamism to the countryside. Our countryside got better and less poor because of the climate policy. <laughs> It's, it's not the other way around. Uh, it, it was not agriculture that took most of the uh, most farther parts of Costa Rica and marginalized part of the countryside into the mainstream, into economic progress or in prosperity. It was the climate policy uh, because the small farmers became ecotourist entrepreneurs and uh, wildlife researchers. The new generations benefited from it, were able to go to trainings and, and because we didn't have an army, how to protect the 25% of the national parks <laughs> that we expanded afterwards. Uh, the people protected them because they were part of their livelihoods. And uh, so we, we, we diversified our economy. Uh, in 1950, just for, for some numbers, in 1950, Costa Rica and banana exports accounted for 88% of our total exports in the 50s. Today, there are less than 11%. So what, what were the, the climate policies? Very quickly. I, I would mention five, but probably the experts on this will, <laughs> will, will, will be mad at me. <laughs> but let me, let me go by five. First, uh, the protection of 25% of, of, of the national territory 
in the in the seventies, as I said. Uh, you know, when I got to be to be in the Minister of Finance in the in the eighties, mid eighties, we will stay still paying. And this I know because I saw the checks. <laughs> so <laughs> we will still pay the uh, national parks and the expropriations to have the national parks and protect them. Uh, renewal, renewable electricity. Uh, you know that Costa Rica has like, around 99% of renewable uh, energy uh, right now. And it was made available in the countryside in the 50s and 60s, yes. Then we had the incentives for ecotourism in the 80s and 90s. So Costa Rica's tourism industry was not an all-inclusive tourist industry. It were medium and small size enterprises. Uh, that and, and so there was this sharing of the prosperity that tourism uh, uh, brought, not without tensions of water and, and resources. It's, it's not, uh, this is not the Shangri-La, yes? <laughs> uh, but we were able to uh, have a different model. And since nature was such a important part of Costa Rica being competitive because we couldn't compete by prices. We needed to compete by something else. So the attachment of the people and the defense of the people in terms of the environment it only grew, it grew not, not the other way around. Then we had early reforestation initiatives, tax rebates for tree plantations in 1972, forest credit certificates in 1986. I was in government at that time in the finance minister. <laughs> forest protection certificates in 1995. I also was in the government at that time. So I'm very proud of this. And you know, when, when, when we started, it, we didn't know how to do it well. <laughs> we needed to, exper to uh, experimentation and, and, and correct ourselves to think again, because the first incentives only went to the, to the big farmers, <laughs> because they were the only ones that could really wait for the benefits of the reforestation. But then we learned, and then we went to the small farmers, and Costa Rica today have reversed deforestation. We have more a, a more green... Uh, a coverage uh, than we had before. Uh, it's one of the few uh, countries in the world that has been able to do that. And then our famous policy of all, the payment for environmental services in 1996. So we were the recipients this year of the Prince William's Earth Shot Prize because of that, because of the payment for environmental services. And we recognized at that time four services provided for, uh, by forest ecosystems. First, mitigation of greenhouse gases. Second, hydrological services. We, I am talking about 1996, just for you to remember, yes. Hydrological services, biodiversity conservation, and finally, the, the provision of scenic beauty for recreation and tourism. And this allowed us to, to contract landowners for the services provided by their lands using the National Fund for Forest Financing. Because of early reforestation efforts, we already had a system then in our treasury to pay for these efforts. Uh, as I, I have told you, as finance minister, we experimented, but we never, uh, this persevering part, the tenacity part that David was talking about, uh, not because we failed the first time, we abolished the, the objective of trying to do it well. <laughs> that many times happens, yes, when, when you are talking about social. And it's, it's interesting to think that many of the innovations in social and environment, when they don't resolve the first time, they are abolished. In economics, it doesn't happen because when you go to the market and you 
try things, you try again and again and again. And probably that was part of our success that we persevered and we learned from, from our mistakes. So, uh, you, know, you, you know, in a way, uh, thinking aloud, good climate policy requires two things, yes? It requires making trade-offs into win-wins. And I am very sad to see that the trade-off narrative is coming back in the negotiations, because I think that in 2015, we were able to talk about the win-wins much more. And we, you need, apart from uh, transforming trade-offs into win-wins, you, you have to make people feel the benefits firsthand. And Costa Rica did both. So our climate policy is the, re is, 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 is the result of decades of trial and error. <laughs> it is based in practices, not only in principles. We are empiricist also, not only uh, the, you no know, ethics and values were very important. And I don't want, you know, this is very important, but you also have to uh, let yourself to make empirical, <laughs> you know, um, errors and, and mistakes. And, and you, you cannot be a maximalist from the beginning. You, you need to set up the process, yes? Uh, and, and we learn how to get incentives right. And that, that was a very important part of our history. And culture and education matter. Uh, when we protected 25% of our territory in the 70s, this, in the first part of the 70s, in the second part, we included this as something in school <laughs> and in education. And so our children were better than us. <laughs> and I remember when my children were in school and there was a famous slogan in schools and it was sustainable development welfare forever. And that's what they learned. And that's what they try to maintain today. You know, so, so it was very important. So let me, let me finish with some very general lessons. There are probably much more, but maybe uh, this one that I say a lot uh, is that Costa Rica is an example of development not being short-term. Short-termism is killing us. <laughs> and we, we had a long-term view, but we also understood that the short and the long-term start at the same time. So we did both. We had a vision. So short-term is not only a, you know, a linear succession. Long-term is not a linear succession of short terms. <laughs> yes, you have a line and the short term has to bring you closer to that target, to that objective, to that vision. And for that, you need a strategy. And that's the other part. You need a stable strategy, not only a strategy, a stable strategy. And for that, you have to build consensus. And in this polarized world, and my country right now is not, is not, a, a, an exception on the polarization that we are seeing everywhere uh, that is not allowing countries to have a national project that is shared by all that really brings shared prosperity and inclusivity so uh, to build consensus to have not only a strategy but a stable strategy is essential and the third i already said Experiment, experiment, experiment. Learn and revise. Learn and revise. Uh, bring the universities, bring the research, bring the evidence-based. Innovate, you know, look at the new ideas, hear other experiences, but don't try to copy, please adapt. <laughs> uh, be resistant to the latest fashion or panacea that is being sold to you. Uh, and for that, you need to build your own capacity, your own capacity. 
And you have to build the capacity also for public policy, not only in the private sector. You need capacity in the public sector. You need to invest in good institutions and, and bring the best of policy making. Embrace new leaderships. <laughs> Very important. <laughs> they will bring new breath, uh, fresh air. Never lose the end game of improving people's lives, please. Never lose the end game. And the, my two final points, damage is never irreversible. Dry land can be a forest. And we prove that. And poverty is not a destiny. And my last point, thinking about Costa Rica, is that nothing is ever so small that it cannot make a difference. A small country of small farmers can bring itself to be our leader. Thank you. <laughs> Rebecca, you have to imagine that I'm a whole hall of people clapping for you. <laughs> <laughs> it's so strange when you make these speeches without the reactions of us all i know and you did so well and i want you to know that we're here and we're clapping and i've been writing and you know wanting to say oh she's so right yes i want to know how um but yeah thank you so much and i say this because i live in a small country with a small population that is very rural and we are really well educated and we're way more wealthy than Costa Rica ever was or is right now. And we haven't managed to do this. So what you have done is significant. It is not changing small countries is hard. I, I'm, I'm living in one that's finding it really hard to change, really hard to adapt to, to what's out there. And so it really is commendable what Costa Rica has done. But more important that you do now what you're doing, which is share what you learned so that those of us who are trying to make change now with less time to do it. So we can't go back to 1869 and we can't go back to 1948 and we can't go back to the 1970s. We just have to do it faster right now, which means we have to learn from each other. We have to share our experiences. We have to be prepared to fail and we have to innovate on a scale like we've never innovated before. And I really love what you said about, and all the time keep the central focus on people and making their future better. Um, so Rebecca, thank you, thank you, thank you from us all. I know there are gonna be loads of questions. They're starting to come in already. You were really inspiring. Um, hi everybody, welcome back. Um, we were just in mid chat and there we are back in the plenary. I'm sure the same happened to many of you. Um, so we are now going to turn to Rebecca for some questions. Thank you to those of you who have been sending them in the chat. Please continue to do so. Um, I'm just going to read out the first question and um, put it to Rebecca. And then I have one of my own I might come to after that. So Noel and Kumpel notes that Costa Rica gave a lot of leadership on um, the new universal right to a healthy environment that has been recognized by the UN Human Rights Council just this October. So the question to Rebecca is, how could this new right to a healthy environment be used to support wider transformation and change in the sustainable development agenda? Yeah, Rebecca. I, I think, I, I think Tara, it, that is very, the normative is very important because mm. it's true that it doesn't happen by decree, but it gives you an instrument to push the agenda. And I, I think that the most important thing that I've learned with respect to the human rights agenda, and in this case, the rights to a healthy environment, is that you have to educate the citizenship because they are the ones that have to use the right to claim it. <laughs> And I think that that is the most important thing. The most important thing is that there will be a place where you can claim the right that you are not receiving. And uh, you have to educate people in that they have that possibility, that there is that right, that they can make use of the different human rights instruments to try to make it happen for you. Yes. And there, 
it, it probably, I, I would stress collective action, yes? You have to not only educate people, but organize people in that respect. Because if there is a resolution that is part of the normative framework of the multilateral system that all countries agreed on, your country too. <laughs> so you can uh, uh, really make it an instrument of change. Yes, but you have to organize, you have to educate, you have to make people know that the right exists, that it was approved, that, and how to use the instruments, you know, that, that will be the, 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 the important effort that we have to make. Uh, that yeah, was that was it, that was perfect. That's one question. In the meantime, I'm just going to ask Rebecca my own question. So Rebecca, in my small country where we're trying to catch up with you and the, the rate of change and pace of change, particularly on um, sustainable development and climate action, um, it strikes me that what we need to get to is what you called a sense of common national project uh, defended by the people. So whilst we have quite a lot of consensus in our political system around the need to take climate action, we have very differing views amongst our different publics when it comes to implementing climate action. So we have a very difficult conversation between, say, for example, our farming community um, and those seem to be taking ambitious climate action. How, how do you get, how does a country create a, nation, a common national project and how do you create the space for a conversation that can then be inclusive rather than uh, partisan? Well, that's a very <laughs> difficult question. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't I don't have I don't have all the answers, but but let me share some so, some of my experience, yes, because uh, you you get to you you get to consensus or to a common project. Uh, not because there are no differences, because you but because you have spaces where where you can bring them uh, uh, into uh, an agreed outcome, an agreed solution, yes? And I think that part of the problem still is, and I'm sorry to say this, having been in the UN for so long, I, I really feel that we are still in the silos mm -hmm. and that the silos have become more and more maximalist. <laughs> so, you know, if, if it, I, Sustainable, you know, a, a sustainable solution has to come from the three sides of the solution. Yes, it has to come from the economy, it has to come from the social and inclusivity, and it has to come from the environment. If only the environmentalists lead, we have a problem. If only the economists list you have lead, you have a problem. Yes, and if if only the poverty people lead, you have a problem. So you need to bring the communities of practice together. And it doesn't matter what is the window or the door that you open to get there, you need to get to the same solution. I think that part of the problem is policy coherence. Mm. Yes? yes, because you know, one side wants everything and the other side says, but I cannot do it so quickly because it has consequences. You need to understand the consequences of the other, yes? Yeah. Not, not only say, I am the good guy. <laughs> I am the one that have the answers. I am the, the one that have the right values and the, the others are wrong. And so what I want to do is my agenda to preside the others, you know? Yeah. That's why green is difficult from sustainable development because Green can be exclusive, <laughs> you know, green can, can put other people in the margins, you know, if you don't share the technology, if you don't bring the others, it's not enough to be green, it has to be inclusive, <laughs> and, and, and it has to, to give the prosperity people need. Yeah, need absolutely. Yeah. Chris in Wales says you need the teamwork to make the dream work. There you go, I like that. Um, I know we have a question from Claire Shakia from IID. So Claire, if you're at the ready, we might let you ask the question so Rebecca can hear some voices that aren't just mine. Um, sure. So um, lovely to love um, amazing um, 
Rebecca, thank you so much for, for that incredible speak, that incredible talk. So what I was wondering was, you know, Costa Rica has been has been leading from the front for, for so many decades now. Um, how do we build um, the courage, the political courage in other countries? What is it that we can do to, to, to increase the number of Costa Ricas in the globe? Yes. I, I, I was saying in the in the five minutes break that the uh, I was worried about what are the incentives for the long term, <laughs> you know, to build the courage to do it. Uh, you 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 need to show that it is worthwhile. <laughs> yes, and and uh, I think that the youth is is part of what is pushing us. You know, the young people are really you know aware that their future depends on the decisions that are being taken today so that is you know if if i think about where are the voices for 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 the vision for the long term vision i think that it comes a lot from the young uh, and and from important parts of civil society my problem there is that you don't only need a vision, you need a strategy, as I said before, yes? And to have a strategy, you need to be propositive. <laughs> mm. You need to sit down to negotiate. And the spaces for that, uh, like Glasgow, for example, yes, <laughs> um, are, are, uh, are, are uh, how to say, uh, this politely, are not giving people all what they are expecting. <laughs> and so I am very worried that then mistrust is the thing that will uh, prevail. And mistrust is the, the main problem <laughs> if we need to sit down and negotiate a strategy to get to a target. Uh, and, and so uh, the, the, courage, the courage will, will come from the push, <laughs> I think. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, in, in, in a way, more and more, a uh, part of the citizenship is, is, you know, asking leaders to be uh, more responsible with respect to environment and development. Yeah. I think that the courage will also come from this crisis. Yeah. Because uh, development is again in the center and environment is again in the center because we, we, we tend to forget. Yes, suddenly when everything we think is going right, uh, you forget about development and about environment. <laughs> uh, and I think that this crisis has made us more fragile and has shown us how bad it can be when, when we don't take the right actions. Yeah. Yeah, okay, Rebecca, I had asked Patrick um, for his question. He is still listening, so I'm gonna read it out to you. Um, and because it leads on from your comments about Glasgow and COP26. So given the outcomes of COP26, what would Rebecca say is the single biggest problem to solve over the next five years? I assume that's a global problem. Mm -hmm. So what's the biggest, single biggest problem to solve over the next five years? To solve for Glasgow to work. I understand. Uh, yeah, well, I think interpret it as you wish. <laughs> okay, I will do both. <laughs> <laughs> if you give me the opportunity, I have to take the floor. Yes, yes. yes. Uh, the, the main problem to solve uh, uh, at Glasgow is that I, I, I said that. I think that there is profound mistrust Mm. And especially between the developed and the developing countries. And developing countries is, is a diverse group. I, I agree. Yeah. We don't think all the same. But there is this very different narratives <laughs> that sometimes I hear with respect to the negotiations, not with respect to the target. <laughs> yes, but with respect to the negotiations, to what matters to make the journey towards the target. And so different. Uh, and and I, I don't see many places where the developed and the developing countries are really uh, uh, sit and, and dialogue in a more open, in a more open way. So, so uh, uh, there, is, there are entrenched 
positions, yes, that have been very difficult to break. I think that Glasgow was very was very good in terms of that the ambition on the voluntary contributions, yes, that we didn't see in Glasgow will be revised in Egypt in COP27. And I think that that is a make and break moment for, for the world, I really think so. And was very important to, to make that decision, to make the decision to revise them, not in five years time, like, you know, but uh, uh, in, in Egypt. I think that that was very important, but we need to rebuild trust. And part of rebuilding trust, I'm sorry to say this, is to comply with the commitments that everybody made in 2015 <laughs> in the Paris Agreement, and they have not been met. And I think that we have to say that with all the words. Uh, they have not been met and it's part of the discussion. The second, uh, the, second, the second part of the main problem for the next uh, years is the divergence in the, in the recovery and in the asymmetries that have been widened because of the crisis of COVID-19. So the developed world is vaccinating and growing at several times the rates of the developing countries, excluding China, yes? And if you look at the numbers, vaccination, 70% in the advanced countries, 35% in the middle-income countries, 4 5% in the low income countries with many of the African countries with no more than 2% of the population vaccinated. And the G7 countries have locked vaccines in excess of their population in the amount of 3 billion doses, okay? That's enough to vaccinate all Africa with two doses, okay? So that is the problem. The problem is, that we have, you know, they, we, we have to say, we have to celebrate the success of science, but we have to admit the failure of governance. And that will be our main problem in the future. Yeah, thank you, Rebecca. Yeah, I, I find it so hard to think about how we are going to solve the climate crisis effectively on the global scale when I look at um, the mistakes we're making in finding solidarity to respond um, to the to, to the pandemic. Um, Chris in Wales, oh, who had our teamwork comment a minute ago, here's a quick one for you, um, Rebecca. How do you feel about tourists coming to Costa Rica now? <laughs> That's a tricky one. <laughs> uh, I think, I, I really think that the, what will solve the problem is not the border close downs. <laughs> what mm. will solve the problem is vaccination. And I heard a scientist uh, saying, and he's right, yes, that this problem, the Omicron, the, you know, the, the new variant, is because we didn't do what we had to do. So let's do it now. You know, you have the PCRs, you have, we have learned during these two years, yes? We have learned. We can do it much better, yes? But if what we are is only afraid, you know, uh, that will be a problem because then you take the, the you know, you, you, you take the P of politics and not the P of the pandemic into account. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, so my call is to be evidence-based, to be science-driven, <laughs> to understand what you have to do and not to be led by local politics and, uh, you know, fear. Okay, thank you, Rebecca. Rebecca, I'm gonna read out one of the questions and then I can see there's a few hands up as well. So uh, Neri Ozer asked, um, how did Costa Rica manage to make and implement such radical decisions while its neighboring countries, much bigger states, didn't? Well, what were a couple of the big differences in your opinion? Yeah, it's a, it's a, very, it's a very good question, you know. Um, uh, as I said, since, since very early days, because we didn't have big population, we didn't have uh, the natural resources that were 
you know, valued at the time that allowed us for more policy space <laughs> for Costa Rica uh, in a way, you know, uh, it, it allowed for less concentrated power. And, uh, and, and that was very important to the building of, 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 a, of a different society. And, and we had very good leadership, yeah, at very crucial moments, you know. And that's why I stressed the three moments of, of uh, that made Costa Rica, Costa Rica different, yeah. And once you have that dynamic, uh, what is happening, the, the, the example of your neighbors is, is not one that you want to follow <laughs> because you are doing better <laughs> because you understand what is it to have more consensus, more institutions, more human development. The problem now, let, let, and let me be very frank, is that I really believe that it's very important regional integration to make the next step and, and to me, to, to, to do the, the quality jump. And for us, it's very important that our neighbors will have also stable, successful, you know, uh, political systems and, and, and societies. It's as vital to us as to uh, as our own, yes? And I think that there has to be a, 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 an effort in that, in that direction, really. And the other problem, and I'm sorry, here to say, Tara, is that uh, uh, the, the organized crime and narcotraffic is really, really having a great toll on us in our institutions, in our societies, in our dynamics. And for that, we need multilateral help. <laughs> we mm. need uh, an international framework. Not, it's not Central American alone, the one that will be able to deal with that. And that will that will also help the whole, all the countries of of the region. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, and thank you for being honest about that that in that significant challenge too, and how it does require again more than the efforts of one country to solve it. Rosa Vohan, I think, asked this question in Spanish, Rebecca, and it's been translated. What percentage of the land um, in Costa Rica is in the hand of private landowners? Um, how many hotels are managed for big multinationals? So how how do you manage the kind of the getting the balance between the large sectors of public land that you spoke about and, and getting the private landowners on board? And particularly, I guess, in this case, if it's, you know, international hotels that are that are having some of the role to play. I, I will ask my people to look for the number, but I think that we are over 30 percent of public land right now. Uh, the land reform that took place in the 70s is, is in the hands of uh, small landowners. Yeah, so I don't think that Costa Rica has a lot of public land uh, for, for uh, production exploitation. And I think that the, the reserves and, and public land should be more than 32% right now. But let's, let's look for the, for the number. Uh, now. And there are big multinationals and big hotels in Costa Rica. There are also all-inclusive hotels, yes, but there, th that is not the center and, and, and heart of the tourists uh, um, coming to Costa Rica, yes. Um, many of the of the small holders are the ones that have, you know, the 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 tours to the national parks and, and the explanations uh, with respect to the local culture. And a lot of rural, rural tourism starts to be very important. And wellness, wellness mm. tourism is becoming very important in Costa Rica. So there are these other forms of tourism that they uh, survive together with the big ones. And the big ones are not the, the largest part of a, uh, of the tourist the dynamic, yes? There is much more sharing, as I say, of the, of the tourist industry. But it's, it doesn't mean that there are no problems. There are problems and tensions, be, as I said, between land and, and, invest, and foreign investment or water and tourist and, and the tourism and agriculture and water use. You know, there are tensions. 
but Costa Rica has been able to have institutions that are much better trained to, uh, to deal with them, yes? Uh, probably now the important thing will be to really support lo local municipalities, local governments, to have much more strength and capacities to deal with these problems. Because many times is they are weak and then corruption or, or you know, lack of uh, capacity to negotiate are coming in, in, in the way. Yes, and that's something that should be strengthened, no doubt. Okay, so Rebecca, time for one last question. It has come in from Vanessa Ospina Lopez. What recommendations would you give to countries rich in biodiversity, but with high levels of poverty to help them to mobilize more investment in, con in environmental conservation? Oh, very, that's a very good question. Uh, I believe that the new instruments, Tara, has to uh, be uh, really you know, taken advantage of. You know, the green bonds that many of the, com the, of, of the governments are putting forward you know, or the green funds that are that re, that are the, the the real ones, not the greenwashing ones, <laughs> the, real, the real ones, yes, that have really indicators and you know for for the compliance. I think that those have become very important instruments, you know, and the management of the biodiversity of the forest, the good management for people not to be left out mm. of the, you know, of the things that the forest can uh, give if you manage it well, you know, is is not taking people out of nature, <laughs> is people being able to live in harmony with nature, yes, and I think those are two different ways of looking at it, and and I think that if if you have the projects, if you have if you are able to harness the financing, that there are much more today than it was than we had before, and finally. You know, international, the international community has to comply with the commitments that we made in 2015. And, you know, the 100 billion, at least, that is not enough of the climate funds. And I think that a lot of it has to go for adaptation, not only for mitigation, adaptation has to be a very important agenda. And for biodiversity, adaptation is a very important agenda and so i will uh, uh, you know take my you know uh, 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 make my voice part of that crowd that are uh, trying to put adaptation and international finance at the center of the discussions thank you rebecca well thank you for doing that thank you for your leadership um and we wish you the best of luck with your role in UNCTAD and we are all watching carefully and inspired by your leadership. And thank you for the time this evening and for making this a truly memorable Barbara Ward lecture. Um, I'm going to hand back to Andy, director of IIED for the final word, but uh, Rebecca, from me, thank you very much. Thank you, Tara, thank you very much. Thank you all. Huge thanks, Tara, and, and huge thanks to you, Rebecca. That was really inspiring. And I do think it's important to be reminded of the positive examples. Sure, the histories are unique. Um, sure, not everything is transferable. Not everything is unproblematic as well. Um, but understanding histories of progress can help us to think about the political challenges we face and uh, the ways in which we can think about overcoming them. So huge thanks, Rebecca, for a in very inspiring talk. Um, also, many thanks to Tara for fantastic chairing of the discussion and inputs. And also, I'd like to say some words of thanks to our um, fantastic comms team at IIED, um, who did um, heroic work in turning this round to a fully online event um, very, very quickly. Um, uh, I mean, there's many to mention, but particularly Juliet Tunstall, who you saw at the beginning, Claire Grant Salmon, who over oversaw um, this Barbara Ward lecture, and also Matt Wright and Anne Schulfus, who are also in the team. And a final word of huge thanks to everyone for participating in this event. It was very special for us. 
And to close it out, um, there's a really nice short film um, of Barbara Ward's legacy, um, which I do recommend you watch if you haven't seen it before. So many, many thanks. I mean, it's inconceivable for any Western democracy to subsist even for 10 years more if we didn't have, through progressive taxation, a steady transfer of resources from rich people to poor. Well, I consider that we can begin to talk about the world environment and about safeguarding our planet when we, the rich nations, are giving in perfectly formal, institutionalized tax assistance. Oh at least 1% of our gross national product in development capital for the poorer nations, I would go higher myself. We've got to stop lecturing them while we sit back and in growth, 80% of the world's income for 20% of the world's people. And that, I think, is the critical thing on this development environment issue. you see from the moon. A single, alone, full of light, full of life, and the only single planet that's got these qualities, that that vision, especially among the young, can mean a redirection of how people think about this problem. Because you will not create a community unless you've got some moral commitment. And moral commitment needs some very stern underpinnings, because we ain't moral easy. In this ceremony, which has honored three distinguished citizens of the free world, President Pusey, Father Bunn, and our friend from the world of freedom, Lady Jackson. great is the shortage of capital, so obstructed are the means of development, that they won't even be able to learn from our mistakes. That is the, the, that would be the ultimate tragedy. I mean, for us to go and make the mistakes and then no one to learn from them, that really would be a cosmic bad joke.